Next up, uh, we have uh, a panel discussion, uh, Medical Cranks and Quacks. Uh, it's going to be m uh, moderated by Stephen Novella. You all know him. He's the chief editor of Science-Based Medicine, and apparently he has some podcast. I don't know. Whatever. Um, uh, he'll introduce the rest of the panel. Here we go. Your haiku is, Doctor, doctor, please, it hurts when I go like that. Well, don't go like that. Please welcome Stephen Novella. Thank you, George. Thanks for coming, everyone. I have a very distinguished panel. Uh, I don't need to reintroduce everybody. The, I have Mark Chrislip, Harriet Hall, David Gorski from Science-Based Medicine blog, and Robert Blaskowitz, who was already introduced, also fighting the medical fakers. That's what we, the, all of us do. We all have uh, day jobs and full-time careers, but we spend some of our time uh, trying to combat those people who are promoting pseudoscience in medicine. Uh, we have a kind of a running joke of how almost futile the job is. We, um, Mark Chrislip thinks that our logo should be Sisyphus pushing a rock up a hill. <laughs> but we figured that was a little, little self-defeatist, so um, we, did, we rejected that idea. Basically. And Sisyphus has it easy. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was too easy, right. So um, we, we all have our, uh, those um, cranks, quacks, whatever you want to call them, those people who are promoting something less than science-based medicine in the medical field, and we have been you know, spending years fighting against them, trying to protect patients, protect the public from their snake oil and their nonsense, and we're going to try to you know, give you some uh, an, of an idea of what we're up against, the kinds of people that are out there, why we oppose them, and what are the options that we have before us. So let me just throw this out to the panel and have each of you give an answer to this. Is there one medical faker out there, one person that you feel um, is your nemesis? Who's, the, who's the, the person out there that you would most like to take down or that, that you have spent time directly opposing? Mark? It's probably somebody who combines regular medicine with wackaloon stuff. So it's hard to get too upset with real true believers like Dana Ullman and homeopathy. But when you get someone like Dr. Oz who combines legitimate medicine with borderline medicine and then he starts talking to the dead, which I assume is his critical thinking skills, um, those are the type of people you'd really like to take down because they justify quackery by using real medicine. And that would be my vote, would be the, the legit docs. Yeah, so they blur the lines yes. between real medicine and fake medicine, which is the most insidious, that's the, that's the worst thing that we're fighting against, right, is that exactly. blurring of the lines. Although I did, you know, after I was on the Oz show, I did have um, somebody who, who was a fan of Dr. Oz say that, oh yeah, I like everything that Dr. Oz says, except when he gets into that alternative medicine stuff, then I just ignore him. So I was, I was glad to hear that, but that's just one anecdote. But I think for most people, those blurring of the lines is, is very dangerous. Harriet? Well, one of the ones that really annoys me is uh, Dr. William Ray. Uh, he's in Texas and he treats people who come in with a lot of vague symptoms and he diagnoses them with multiple chemical sensitivities, which is not a recognized diagnosis. And uh, to give you an idea, um, his clinic walls are made of ceramic because anything else he could put on the walls, his patients would react to. He has detoxification saunas in his clinic. He has exercise machines that have had all the lubricants removed from them because his patients are irritated by the lubricants off-gassing. Um, they did a feature on him on Nightline a few years ago and they interviewed one of his patients. She was a medical doctor who'd been diagnosed with depression. She'd been, she had seen a psychiatrist every day for a year, but she finally had to stop going to the psychiatrist's office because of the diesel fumes in the air. Uh, she couldn't drive. And um, he diagnosed her as sensitive to literally everything in her environment. And she moved to an island and she, uh, she built a special home that didn't have any dangerous materials in it. Uh, she takes multiple injections of uh, sort of supposedly allergy shots, but very unconventional ones every day. One of the things she injects into herself is mercury. Um, she won't use her telephone because the magnets in it give, it give her headaches. And she spends two hours a day inhaling oxygen. 
And at the same time, they showed her uh, with her dog and her horse outdoors. She was riding around a dirt arena, stirring up all kinds of dirt. And none of that bothered her because that's natural, but it's man-made chemicals that are causing all her problems, supposedly. Uh, he takes patients like that and he ruins their lives. He turns them into uh, hypochondriacs and uh, hermits. They're afraid to go out of their house. They're, they can't work. He's done a lot of harm to a lot of people. Um, the medical board investigated him. One of the things that came out in the investigation was that he was injecting jet fuel into patients. And he said, oh, well, not really. I'm just injecting a small amount as a, as a, as a skin test for allergies. Well, you can't be allergic to jet fuel. Um, and then later when the board started picking on him, he explained, well, no, he really wasn't injecting actual jet fuel. He was injecting the electromagnetic imprint of jet fuel. Well, the Texas board uh, charged hey, him with six... Texas Medical Board? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew Wakefield Brzezinski? <laughs> yeah. um, they charged him with six different things. I'm going to read them to you. Using pseudoscientific test methods, failing to make accurate diagnoses, providing nonsensical treatments, failing to properly inform patients that his approach is unproven, practicing in areas for which he has not been trained, and representing himself as certified by a board that is not recognized by the American Board of Me Medical Specialties. Uh, it's pretty serious charges and so a lot of So basically all of alternative medicine yeah. is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, after three years, the case was finally resolved with what they call a, a mediated agreed order. And essentially all they did was say he had to revise his consent form. Thank you, Texas. <laughs> David, is there anyone outside of Texas that you would consider a, uh, your, your nemesis or somebody worth going after? Well, I'm torn because you would think after I just gave a 20-minute talk on Stanislaw Brzezinski that I would say it would be him. But I really kind of think Dr. Oz would be the one because he spreads it to millions. Like, Brzezinski doesn't affect anyone other than the patients who come to his clinic. Um, Dr. Oz's effects, pernicious effects go way beyond that. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> Robert, are you going to stick with Brzezinski or you want to add anybody yeah, to the I, list? I'm not that type of doctor. Yeah. So, um, uh, but no, Brzezinski, he's my Vader. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, there's, a, there's a long, long list. Obviously, we could, we could spend hours just going down the list, and you, you could read about many of them uh, in, in the pages of science-based medicine. Um, I have a, you know, a bugaboo about chiropractic neurology because it doesn't exist, and it invades my, my personal specialty. But uh, um, the person that, one person that I, I like to bring up is um, William Hammersfar, because he's a neurologist practicing medicine in Florida, and he decided that he was, would treat strokes and then a long list of other uh, ailments with um, FDA-approved vasodilators, drugs that, that enlarge the blood vessels, um, even though the treatment essentially has been shown not to work. This is something that is actually not an idea new to him. It's been studied 20 years ago and was found not to work, and the concept is not really valid. Uh, the Florida, the state of Florida um, actually took him to court, uh, you know, basically challenged uh, his practice, saying that what he was doing was substandard medicine, because it wasn't based on scientific principles, and they essentially proved their case. They proved before a judge that what he was doing was below the standard of care, so that what he was doing was, was harmful to patients, it was not based on evidence. But then he appealed based upon Florida's uh, recent um, healthcare freedom law which states that if you're practicing alternative medicine, that you, you, the state can't hold you to the standard of care. So in other words, you can do whatever you want as long as you inform your patients that it's alternative. But they didn't define alternative. So here we have an MD prescribing FDA-approved drugs, just doing it wrong, and that's alternative. And, and he won. He got out, he, he slipped away from, regu from any regulation because he was protected, shielded by this law. Which leads me to the next question, is what avenues do we have available to us 
to, to fight these guys. Obviously, we can write blogs and talk about them and, and try to educate the public about why what they're doing is wrong, but it seems like we should be able to shut them down. So what's out there for us and why doesn't it work? It never does seem to work because the only thing you can ever nail somebody for is sex abuse and right. illicit drugs. Yeah. Though I was pleased to see in Washington State, which I hate saying, I should just say Washington, um, that someone got their license put on hold for doing the Marshall Protocol. And that's the first that's time I've ever seen anybody in the medical boards chastised for using alternative medicine. I think it's partly resources, people don't have right. the time, and then you get logged, bogged down in the legal aspects mm -hmm. that, you know, trying to prove it's wacky as it is, is difficult. Yeah. It's a big problem. There are 50 state medical boards and 50 different sets of laws. And Florida is not the only state with a quote unquote health freedom law. I believe Colorado just passed one. It's about two, up to 20 and, or so different and states. There are, and there are states that license naturopathy, which means naturopathy is a legitimate therapeutic, I think it's like 16 or 17 states yeah. now. Yeah. And in those states, naturopathy is legit. And as I like to say, naturopathy is basically a cornucopia of quackery. I mean, basically, it's everything almost. Everything um, other than science-based practices, <laughs> it seems. Maybe there's one or two, you know, thrown in there, but most of what they do seems to be just, yeah, whatever is not based on evidence. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, and in fact, I'll t one thing I always like to say to show about naturopathy, if you want to know how nutty naturopathy is, every naturopathic school requires a course in, courses in homeopathy, Homeopathy is on the naturopathic board examination. God, I would love to see that examination, but <laughs> it, it, we've never been able to get a copy of it. But it, it's basically, that, you know, it's part and parcel of naturopathy. But how are you going to get it abandoned when I have, a, I'm from Oregon, we have a chiropractic college, right. a naturopathic college, a couple of oriental medical colleges, all the institutions have integrative medicine programs, so it's part and parcel of the medical school. It's mm -hmm. part and parcel of medical care. You have reality-based and non-reality-based care together. I don't know how you can say when you have a medical school teaching their residents mm -hmm. Reiki yeah. that that's not legit. It's being done at University of whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. You know, you know what I call Reiki, right? It's faith healing because yeah. it's faith healing using Eastern mysticism instead of Christianity. You're like channeling energy from the quote unquote wow. universal source. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> and my spell checker always makes it R-E-E-K-Y, which I think, Reek yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> that works. Is that anything like Reek? <laughs> Game of Thrones geek, I'm sorry. So, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's infiltrating our own profession. So it's hard for us to, uh, it's getting harder to criticize chiropractic, naturopathy, homeopathy, acupuncturists, when in fact all of those things have infiltrated our own profession. Um, so we're simultaneously trying to clean house, actually just trying to hold back a, a, what seems like a losing war for now, while you know, for entire professions that are based up, not upon science, don't have a culture of science, seem to be gaining ground. So again, like Harriet, where do we go from here? So what do we do to, to, to reverse, turn this barge around? Uh, <coughs> legislation, of course, is the final answer, but that's going to be hard, and I don't see it better legislation coming anytime soon. But one thing that could be done, uh, the medical boards have a certain amount of power, and if they would just do a good job, uh, we could make some progress there. But uh, we've got a bunch of bureaucrats and wimps and people without balls that are on the medical boards. I, um, <laughs> that, that's true. And, and they, they can be intimidated. There was a case in Washington oh, yeah. State where uh, a doctor was found um, to be using one of those electrodermal diagnosis machines. Those machines are illegal. And uh, he should have been chastised for using them. Uh, but his lawyers wrote personal letters to everybody on the medical board threatening a lawsuit if they continued to investigate, and they promptly dropped it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, go ahead. Yeah, one thing that... Yeah, Brzezinski, right? <laughs> yeah, this is going to be Brzezinski. Is this... Can you hear that? 
Yeah, just get closer to the mic. Okay, um, yeah, much better. Um, I think that we can actually help uh, these medical boards. Um, you know, there was, there was a, a, a case um, a couple of months ago when uh, one of the, the physicians uh, appeared to be announcing test results on the Brzezinski patient group uh, Facebook page, um, which would be a major violation of patient confidentiality, and a skeptic took a screenshot and sent it to the medical board. I mean, th these are the types of, of, of shenanigans where non-experts can intervene and maybe be useful um, to point this stuff out to them. Right, and, and there, it's politics too. For instance, I'm quite convinced that, you know, part of the reason Brzezinski's still in operation 36 years later, you know, 15 years after the consent agreement, is he has political allies. Um, he really does. I mean, Joe Barton, as I mentioned before, and I'm sure there are a bunch of local politicians that can put pressure on the Texas Medical Board, so they're, they're afraid of him. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot of money in, yeah. in selling fake medicine, and so and money equals political connections equals power equals shield the ability to shield themselves. So just to, if I can, just quickly encapsulate, there are, what are the potential mechanisms out there? At the federal level, we have the Federal Trade Commission that can prosecute people for false advertising, essentially, fraud in the marketplace. Um, and I don't know about you guys, uh, I found them to be willing. Um, sometimes they have their heart in the right place, they try, but they're overwhelmed and they just sort of pick and choose what they want to go after. They certainly don't have the will or the ability to go after everything that's out there. Have any of you ever dealt directly with the, the FTC? No. Which is kind of a statement in and of itself. So I try to help them out when I can, but nothing much comes of that. At the federal level also, there is the FDA. So if, it, if anything that involves um, pr uh, using a drug outside of its, the legal parameters or using something that's not approved, using an unapproved drug. That's pretty much the only time you're going to be able to get the FDA involved in shutting down a charlatan is when they're using an unapproved drug. Using a pr an approved drug off-label, it's fine. That's nothing the FDA can concern themselves with. Um, have you, and again, have any of you guys y utilized the FDA in terms of you know, directly well, opposing. Well, that's interesting because I've known reporters who have tried to get, you know, to get it to the FDA about Brzezinski and yeah. they're pretty tight-lipped. Yeah, you know? one of the, the weird things, um, you know, I was reading Ben Goldacre's book about uh, bad pharma and kind of how the system kind of enables some type of shenanigans. And when they said that when you, you would file a FOIA request um, for, say, a protocol to yeah. see what they're, what they're doing, you, you don't get that information because it's proprietary um, and, right, right, and, and right. that's exactly what happened when I did that for right. Brzezinski. They wouldn't give me any information. For, for, until the drug is approved, it's considered a trade secret. Yeah. Right. But, but what are like with DCA, David, you've written about that. That's, that's an industrial chemical, right? Yeah, the FDA used. actually did ultimately shut this guy down. Yeah, that's so what he's talking about. DCA is dichloro, uh, dichloroacetic acid, <laughs> right? And it's it, you know, it, it is used for diseases of metabolism, and a few years ago it was found in preclinical models, mainly rodent models, to have potential activity against um, brain tumors. And so it's a simple chemical to make. So this, this pesticide salesman, I kid you not, um, started selling it. He, and, and he did something really interesting. He sold it as quote unquote pet DCA. You buy it for your pet with cancer, and, you know, because the regulations in veterinary medicine are, you know, not as tight. And everybody, everybody knew these people were buying it for themselves. But, you know, this charade worked for a while. But eventually the FDA did shut him down. Right, right. But when drugs aren't involved, uh, or, or marketing fraud, well, it's all marketing fraud, but, you know, the FTC is unlikely to be helpful. And the federal government otherwise is pretty much out of the picture. Right? Well, then, well, yeah. I mean, like, again, I hate, keep going back to Brzezinski, <laughs> but as, as long as he didn't ship it, you know, early on, as long lines. as he didn't ship it across state lines, yeah. they couldn't really do much. And, and because it wasn't, it, it, technically at the time, 
wasn't illegal in Texas. Right. And they tried very hard to prove he shipped it across state lines, but he was actually very careful, and as far as they could tell, they could never prove that he did. Right. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise, we're at the state level, right? So most people don't realize that. The AMA, by the way, doesn't regulate medicine. People say, what, are we doing? what is it about the AMA? The AMA is a, is a professional group. They don't regulate anything. The states regulate the practice of medicine. They license professionals. You know, they, um, if you're practicing below the standard of care, whatever, that's all on the state. And we've, that's what we've been, that's why we keep talking about the Texas state, the Florida state board, the boards of health of each state would be the one you would go to with a specific complaint about a practitioner. And the, the kinds of complaints you could bring against them, one is they're practicing outside their scope which the scope of practice is basically the parameters that they are licensed to, to practice, or that they're practicing substandard care. Um, and that's why the, the charlatans are trying to, one, expand their scope, and two, eliminate the standard of care. With those two barriers gone, it's, you know, it's the golden age of quackery. Right? There's absolutely nothing to stop them. And then, no matter, even if we have an ironclad case against them, there's simply no legal mechanism to shut them down, which again, like somebody like Brzezinski can be practicing for decades with, without being able to shut him down. And, and what I can never, he's not an oncologist. He, he, he's never, he never trained in medical oncology. He's not a board certified oncologist. Um, he would be a GP, he's not even board certified in internal medicine. You know, <laughs> so which is the MD, first step. So he's an ND, not a doctor. Huh? Say that he's again. an ND, not a doctor. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, no, he has, a, he has a legitimate MD, but, it, you know, he, he's never done any training beyond an internship, as far as I know. Right, so he's not, you know, not specially trained as an oncologist, but that's a good point, that when we're, you're licensed by the state, you're actually licensed to practice medicine and surgery. Right, you can do the, anything Yeah, almost. the scope of practice is basically everything. So what then regulates the, the, the uh, ethical scope of practice for physicians who are essentially licensed by the state to do anything? Um, well, I mean, these days it tends to be getting, getting uh, certified for insurance plans and hospital privileges because right. most, you can't get privileged in a hospital now unless you're board certified in a recognized specialty. Uh, you most of the time can't get on insurance plans unless you're board eligible or board certified in a you know, recognized specialty. Right. But so the solution to that is set up your own institute and <clears throat> charge cash. Right. Which is why this is, that's pretty much what they do. Right? You have the, the Bob's Institute of whatever, and <laughs> give it an impressive name, um, tr basically charge patients cash, you know, and then you, all, of, all of those problems, getting privileges, charging insurance companies, they go away. So every barrier has been systematically removed. David, you brought up the Colorado law. This one goes beyond just a healthcare freedom law. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember the details, but it, like, it, it's basically, it, as far as we say, it legitimizes quackery. It, it, it almost anything goes. <laughs> yeah, essentially I think Jan Bellamy, who also writes for SBM, called it the Quack Full Employment Act. Yes. <laughs> because it essentially says the scope of practice of alternative practitioners is pretty broad. I think they only limited them from doing major surgery. They, I, think. I don't think they could prescribe prescription medications yeah. a, a, either, but they could pretty much do anything else. But pretty much anything else. So the, the, another way to go against a charlatan is to get them for practicing medicine without a license. So that barrier is being systematically removed as well. So no standard of care, no insurance coverage, no privileges, no practicing medicine without a license. What's left to us, you know, in terms of a regulatory uh, option, there really isn't much. So, I mean, essentially they've won. They've, they've removed every regulatory and legal barrier um, get, you know, that we could use to shut down the practice of fake medicine. And they're, they're not, they haven't completed that process, but they're making steady progress doing that state by state in all of those various ways. So, again, we're down to just educating the public and lobbying for you know, to reversing this trend, to trying to get more rational, um, more rational, you know, regulation. So, um, where does that leave us? Like, you know, Mark Harriet, we, we, where, where do you think uh, we could go from here in terms of? Well, let's say, um, let's focus on the assuming we can't fix the, the broken regulations. Then, so then, what do we do to protect our patients, protect the public from these quacks? Well, hell, you've convinced me. I'm changing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm setting up a clinic. I think the only thing you have to offer is, at this point, education and trying to yeah, reverse yeah. the tie. 
I mean, all the, and, and the problem is when they have state regulation and they have societies, it's going to be impossible to get rid of them. Yeah. And I, it's, it's education. Certain things, I think, over time become an embarrassment for people. It, and right now, alternative medicine is not an embarrassment to use. If you can make your, someone's belief system embarrassing as part of a cultural phenomenon, people will tend to drift away from it. I think certain evil parts of it, Western society have drifted away because people are embarrassed to be seen as racists or whatever. It helps. Ridicule. Yeah. Ridicule. Yeah. Ridicule yeah. works to some extent. Yeah, Not I, one to one with patients. I agree that education is key, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get good scientific information out there on the internet where people can find it. And the other thing, I, I think we ought to be able to do something to uh, improve on uh, enforcing the laws that we do have. There, there were two cases in Washington State uh, of people practicing medicine without a license. Uh, one of them was a veterinarian who was using one of those electrodermal diagnostic machines. And she was ordered to stop practicing medicine without a license. And she moved a few miles over the border into Idaho and started a new clinic and kept right on going. And uh, there was an, a case that I reported where some kind of a, a spa of totally non-medical people were using one of those diagnostic machines. And I reported them to the state attorney general. And I got a nice note back from the investigator saying, thank you for reporting this. We, we want to investigate those people, but we're not allowed to do it until somebody like you makes a report. Thank you so much. But then he uh -oh. investigated and they said, oh, well, they're not really practicing medicine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the big thing with state medical boards. A lot of them can't do anything until there's a complaint. Yeah. So that's something that, that anybody can do. Anybody could file a report to the FDA, the FTC, the state medical board. But it sometimes has to be a patient yeah. complaint, so an actual patient who yes. thinks that he's been a victim of, you know. Right. And, and, and that's one of the things that with the other Brzezinski patient group, that since we've been critical and, and open and vocal, people are finding that there are other people who have felt burned too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they often don't know how to report uh, these things, so we try to, to guide them to the, to the right people. Right. Um, yeah, you're right. So you need a victim. You know, so a lot of sometimes the legal process doesn't get underway until somebody says, I was harmed by this practitioner. Right. And those, are, those people, though, are amazingly difficult to find because well, nobody wants to admit that well, they fell for you know, something fringy like that. Well, coming back to Texas again, and this is not about Brzezinski this time. <laughs> okay. um, I, forgot the, I forgot the doc's first name, but his last name was Arafiles. Um, the, does anyone remember the Texas uh, nurses in, from Winkler, Texas, yes. who wanted to report this guy for s pushing supplements, uh, doing substandard medicine in, in, in the ER and stuff like that? The, the, this guy was buddies with the sheriff, and they found out who made the complaint. Texas at the time did have an anonymous, a law where you could complain anonymously about a practitioner. And they found out about him, and they, got, they were almost put in jail. For, uh, you know, for quote unquote violating patient confidentiality to send the medical records, even though Texas law says that using medical, patient medical records to make a complaint about substandard care is not a violation of HIPAA, which is the right. privacy law. But you, you can't get a patient complaint <coughs> if you give the therapy, the patient gets better, you get credit, you give the alternative therapy, they don't get better, well, you didn't come to me soon enough. So yeah. you're in a win-win situation. And or even, they're dead. Yeah. And dead yeah. people don't file And even complaints. the worst one, chiropractic, all the complications that they get, they consider to be part of the therapy, you know? Mm -hmm. give it's, very it's very convenient. It's very convenient. Way. So you can't do wrong to have a complaint. Right. So, I mean, the, you, part of their shtick is sort of preparing for failure. If it doesn't work, they have, you know, lots of things to blame other than themselves. Yeah. And their patients will probably buy that, just like they bought their, the original justification for going. So again, it becomes really hard to find patients who are willing to say, I was harmed by this practitioner. But when we do, then we have the, so another avenue that we have before us that we haven't discussed, we talked about federal regulation, very limited, state regulation, political will isn't there, and their power, even when they have the political will, their power is being taken away from them systematically by gullible state legislatures. But then there's the legal avenue, so suing practitioners for malpractice, for harming patients. This is now is not regulatory, this is civil. 
Um, we don't see an, a, a lot of this either. And, and does anyone have, on the panel have any ideas about why? Uh, have we failed to explore this avenue adequately? Or can we support this avenue more? Or is it just, are there things that are, limi are there limitations from not thinking? Well, a lot of these practitioners don't carry malpractice insurance, so there's no deep pocket that the lawyer is willing to go after. Well, the one thing they teach us in malpractice courses is it's not screwing up that gets you sued most of the time. It's when you establish a bad relationship with the patient and they feel like they somehow have been uh, lied to or kept out of the secret. Mm -hmm. But screwing up won't get you sued because everyone, no one's perfect. I should phrase that differently. Um, I don't want to say everyone screws well, up. Well, well, but they, well, don't, they establish it's all about the relationship. Yeah. So you're not going to have a dissatisfied relationship with an alternative practitioner because that's, at some level, all they have to offer. That's the only level. A case in point, I, I got an email from uh, someone who had had a stroke after a chiropractic neck manipulation. And uh, it sounded like he had done some really inappropriate things, and I asked them if they had reported him. And they said no. In fact, they'd never even gone back to the treating chiropractor to let him know that the patient had had a stroke. And uh, you, you've got to have a patient complaint to do anything. There was a, a chiropractor in Seattle, I think she's still, still practicing, that I called a no-touch chiropractor. She was doing uh, neck uh, manipulations of a special type, upper cervical chiropractic. And she would take one hand over the other and she'd go, Ugh, and make a cracking sound in her own wrists <laughs> while she was about this, this remember, far above the patient. <laughs> now, they did a, a, a news story on a news magazine, and the video was available online, and I sent that to the chiropractic board, and I said, look, she's doing a procedure that's not approved. There's a list of things that chiropractors can do, and no-touch chiropractic is not on the list. Besides which, she's telling these patients that she's giving them upper cervical adjustments and she's not touching them. So she's charging them for something that she didn't do. And they dithered around and they misinterpreted what the video said and I had to file a second complaint to say, go back and look at the video. And uh, the upshot of it was uh, they decided they wouldn't do anything because no patient had complained. Mm -hmm. I had a patient once had a Long story, weird complication from chiropractic, and I told, I told the patient, I think it's probably from the chiropractic. And she's, oh, I love Dr. Bob. He's like one of the family. I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. You had a month-long hospitalization from that. The, the patient, uh, Kathy, who was in my talk, um, who was at the clinic and only later found that she was not going to get the antineoplast, and she said, well, this was part of my path. Part of my path, right. You know, and I, you know, I, I believe she's still she's still with us, um, and I sent her a note saying, you know, if it's not just you, right? I mm -hmm. mean, this, this there there are lots of recurring complaints. You know, make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. I haven't heard back from her. I read about a family that had uh, had one member with a, a stroke due to a chiropractic neck manipulation, and they liked the chiropractor so much they kept going back until three family members had had strokes. So what can you do? They're, they have great bedside manners. Uh, they spend a lot of time with patients. They're very caring. And uh, patients love them and don't want to sue them. Yeah, road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we have uh, about eight minutes left. I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, is, George, is there a microphone in the audience? Are you going to pass that around? So any, yeah. while George is doing that and people are queuing up, any final thoughts before we go to questions? Just, just one quick thing. Go ahead. There are risks to doing this. Yeah. For instance, I, you know, I showed that the, just the Twitter stuff was nothing, but this here is a letter I got a few, about a month ago from my state medical board um, saying that some time ago an allegation was filed against you with this office. After a thorough review of the matter, we have determined that a violation of the public health code cannot be established. Accordingly, our file has been closed. Imagine my relief. Um, however, I'm pretty sure I know who did this and it's a Brzezinski patient. Yeah, so, I mean, there is some liability on our side. You know, the people do Cause, go, cause go she also, after us. She also called my university. I yeah, so something like well. our bosses can get called. Complaints can be filed against us because, you know, we're just trying to say what we believe is the truth. Um, you know, our credentials could be questioned. 
you know, we, we do put ourselves out there. I mean, fortunately, I don't, I'm not familiar with anything really bad happening, but we're always, we're always like waiting for the hammer to drop. Take a first question. Hi, this is Susan. Um, don't forget to mention that Wikipedia has been a major battlefield. We've oh, got yes. 23,000 oh, yes. views to the clinic's page this last month. Also, Rebutter and Web of Trust, that's something all of us can be doing. Join Skeptic Action. Absolutely. Yep, control <laughs> the flow of information. Okay. What she said. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of which, a um, quick plug um, the uh, JREF is selling uh, the science based medicine ebooks. You can, you can download them through the JREF uh, for, the, for the Nook, yes. for the Kindle. Buy, buy them, read them, yes. love them. Uh, you can also, if you want to get them all in one fell swoop, you can get C, uh, CDs with all of the books on all the formats at the SGU table out front. When it comes to Wikipedia, could I just mention yep. that, that that is so effective that Wikipedia was singled out in the most recent Brzezinski movie yes. as being controlled by evil skeptics? No, seriously. No, yeah. Yeah. Watch the movie on Recall. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You have to unleash the evil hordes of skeptics to control <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> Um, I have two kind of short questions. One is, um, how do I ensure that my physician is a science-based physician, and where can I send my friends besides science-based medicine to get more information about the chiropractics that they go to? Um, before I jump in, does anybody want to offer an answer? The answer to the second question is quack watch. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good, yeah. Now, yeah. It, it, it's, some of it's a little out of date, but it's still solid by and large. Yeah, and there may be plans to update and, it. And, and there, yes, yeah, we'll leave it at that. But um, also just to search on the, the specific item that you're interested in, comma, skeptic. Yeah. And you will get to lots of resources that may not be on those two websites, Science Based Medicine or Quackwatch. Those are probably the most dense resources, but the other resources are spread throughout the Skeptiverse on the, on, online, so just chiropractic skeptic. And our hit rate is really good. Uh, we do actually do very well in terms of page ranking of skeptical articles because, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. They're actually fairly academic. We're well re linked. So that, that search um, is effective. What, I'm sorry, what was the other question? How do I know if my physician's a yeah. science-based physician? Any, any thoughts for the panel? Well, if he recommends acupuncture, he probably isn't. But no, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, that was a cheap, cheap you know, as oh. As a philosophical approach to medicine, I would probably say that 99% of doctors are not science-based. We don't have a background of training to think critically in our it's consumption of a huge amount of information and trying to synthesize it. So you'll find that most docs are evidence-based and they right. follow the protocols and the Cochrane reviews and, the, and those things. But um, this table is probably pretty much all the science-based medicine docs in the United States. Well, I wouldn't <laughs> nah, go that far. But, 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 close. Uh, but Mark's our uh, resident nihilist. That's right. Well, medical school really isn't, doesn't teach science per se, it teaches you how to be a doctor, yeah. like how to yeah. treat patients, and somewhat how to evaluate evidence, but it's not the primary mission. Yeah, but to, to, to more directly to your question, I would say that certainly watch out for red flags. Take them seriously. Don't brush them off. You know, if they recommend something that sounds quacky, it probably is, and it, just question it. You know, you could find another resource even another doctor, if you feel it's something a really critical decision, and see if they they agree with you know if, if, with the first opinion. Um, so the, the, I think just the red flags is probably the, the most useful way. If something doesn't feel or sound right to you, don't take it for granted. Don't assume it's because they know better than you do. Investigate it till you feel satisfied and happy with it. And you can judge a doc by the company he keeps. If yeah. they're in or she, if they're in a big clinic associated with a major hospital institution that does not have an integrative medicine program, odds are pretty good you have a good group. If it's the uh, University of Minnesota integrative medicine program, yeah, you might want to go somewhere. Else. See if their name rhymes with Dr. Boz too. It's always good. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering, since you don't hold the highest opinion of some of the standards in the U.S., are there any countries where, where you think uh, just has better standards or, or that you're looking to integrate or just sort of uh, something along those lines? I'm not I, sure I'm knowledgeable enough. I, I mean, it's a problem States. everywhere, but it seems particularly acute here. Yeah, well, there, there's no science-based medicine utopia out there. Every country has... <clears throat> They're different problems. They may be better when it comes to regulating marketing claims. 
like the, uh, but they're worse in other respects. Like in the UK, the, uh, the Advertising Standards Association just came out with a, just a devastating critique of homeopathy, which was awesome. I would love the FTC or the FDA to come out with that in the United States, which is just not going to happen. But they have other problems in the UK that we don't deal with. Australia, Canada, you know, the countries that I'm familiar with, they have, they're better in some ways, worse than others. It's just a mishmash, but there's no perfect country out there. Antarctica. Antarctica, yeah. Antarctica out here is pristine. Yeah. Antarctica. <laughs> Hi, uh, I just recently heard of um, an organization called Merger Watch. I don't know if any of you guys oh, have heard of Merger Watch. Merger Watch. It's an it's, uh, organization uh, that's concerned about the, when uh, Catholic uh, hospitals merge with, oh, uh, oh, merge okay. with uh, sec secular hospitals, and then they try and uh, impose their religious guidelines on, on mm -hmm. the hospital that they're mm -hmm. merging with. So I don't know if you guys have heard that's of a, it or that's a whole area we didn't get into. About. Yeah. <laughs> I know that can be an issue, but I don't know any details. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not real familiar yeah. with that issue. We'll do one more question. Uh, two um, more. We only yeah. get Joe yeah. in. Yes. Sorry, uh, just a couple of really, really short, quick questions. They're not intellectual or anything. I just didn't catch a couple of things. Um, what did you call a cornucopia of quackery? Naturopathy. Naturopathy. Look it up. Okay. Um, and where was it legal? What's that? About 20 states have legalized, it's something have licensed, like, Yeah, it's like 18 or 20 states. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, they just introduced a bill in Michigan, to, but it doesn't appear to be going anywhere. But they're constantly <laughs> pushing to get licensed in every okay. state. Okay. Thank you. I, I just didn't catch it. Okay. I just wanted to say regarding the question about different countries and how things are working with their laws, one of the things that's actually happened in New South Wales in Australia... Well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, well, nothing at all. Is that, you have a um, funny accent, you think you know what's going on? <laughs> you think you know more about Australia than we do? No. <laughs> sure. Anyhow, the, um, in New South Wales, up until recently, we had a similar problem in that you had to actually, uh, a patient had to lodge a complaint in order to um, have any action taken against a, a practitioner. What's happened is since the failure to prosecute the Australian Vaccination Network for, uh, for their actions, we've actually successfully had the legislation changed in New South Wales so that you can, we can now actually put in these complaints ourselves. They don't actually have to have done anything wrong. So our Healthcare Complaints Commission are now expecting a flood of complaints from skeptics yes. regarding all of the, the practices. So I think the main, one of the main things is you have to lobby your politicians to yes. change the laws. And that's, um, that's a good note to end the panel on. The, the bottom line of all this, again, we're not trying to be nihilistic, we're all do, doing this and we're doing it uh, with, with passion, is that really the thin line between the rest of the world and just being completely overwhelmed by quackery and nonsense is the skeptical movement. We're the last line standing. So we do have to, uh, to keep pushing, to keep fighting the good fight. So thank everyone for coming. And thanks to my panel. Thanks to the panel. Congratulations.